The church say amen. Let the church say amen again. God is good how often? And all the time. Find somebody close by you and say, neighbor, God loves you. And I do too. And if you love me as much as I love you, then nothing can break our love in two. Amen. Certainly it is just one more blessing from the great God of heaven that he has given us yet one more opportunity to come out and worship and praise his holy and his divine name. I would have you to know that this is the day that the Lord has made. Therefore, you ought to sit there and be quiet and be glad in it. Uh, what, what you say? Well, you ought to rejoice. What you waiting on then? Somebody, somebody ought to go ahead and rejoice. Now, I know you was waiting on Trevante to get up here and give you your cue. I know you was waiting on that. But I don't know about you, but I woke up this morning, first thing on my mind was thanking Jesus. First thing on my mind was giving God some praise. I know I didn't wake myself up this morning. I know I didn't start myself on my way. I know I wasn't putting myself in my right mind. I know God had something to do with it. He didn't have to do it, but I'm sure enough glad that he did. And I know your mama told you when you were little, somebody do something for you, you're supposed to tell them what? Tell the Lord thank you this morning. But surely... He has been good to us. Amen. Again, we um, want to thank those of you that are watching us via live stream on this morning. As always, you are welcome, and we thank you for tuning in with us. And we pray that something will be said throughout these services that will have you to question and ask yourself, what is it that I must do in order that my soul might inherit eternal life? It is so good to see everyone that is here in person on this morning. Um, it's good to see that our number is increasing. Amen. Um, it's so good to see all of you that have came out. Um, on this morning, and I, I just have one question. Did anybody come to hear a word from the Lord? Yes. That was a third of y'all. Did anybody come to hear a word from the Lord? Yes. All right, all right. Second Kings chapter 4. Second Kings chapter 4. We're going to begin at verse number 1, conclude at verse number 7. The grass withers, and the flower thereof shall fade away, but the word of God shall stand forever. I'm reminded of an old hymn. I just want to sing a verse of it. I know, I know some of y'all know it. You, you know, you, you heard a long time ago, but I just... Shine on me, Lord, shine on, on me. Second Kings chapter 4, beginning at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for you? In other words, what you want me to do about it? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, your handmaid has not anything in the house except a pot of oil. Then she said, go, borrow vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and thy sons, and shall pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said to her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said, There is not a vessel more, and the oil stayed. Verse number 7. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go. Sell the oil and pay thy debt and live thou and thou children off of the rest. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, dear Lord, be acceptable in thy sight. I want to give for our subject on this morning, the God that knows no limits. The God 
that knows no limits. Here in this Old Testament passage that we find here this morning, it involves one of those mysterious miracle-working prophets of old. For he has been Elisha's understudy, Elijah's apprentice, Elijah's student, and he's been mentored by this elderly man of God, which is aside from the sermon, but I need to just throw it out here that every Elijah needs an Elisha. That, 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 that's not the sermon, but every old man needs to find a young man who's messed up and on the wrong road and help them get straightened out. Because if you ain't remember, somebody found you on the road and helped getting you straightened out. So you need to return the favor. Every Ruth ought to have a Naomi. Every John Mark ought to have a Barnabas. Every Timothy ought to have a Paul in his life. Because you need somebody to help you in your faith walk with God. I know you think you can do it by yourself, but you cannot make it in this walk by yourself. You're going to need somebody there to encourage you along the way. And, and we need need that and you ought to be around godly people in your life. I'm talking about people that can give you some experiences of their faith that can help you build your faith. Amen somebody. You, you build your faith not only by experience but by hearing the stories of other people that God has been good to. So when I hear about the miracles that God has done in somebody else's life, it encourages me to know that my daddy is still in the miracle working business. So when I'm discouraged, I need somebody to come along beside me and encourage me that weeping may endure for a night, but joy shall come in the morning. I need somebody to come, that kind of talk. It stirs my faith to let me know that no matter how dark the night may be, no matter how dismal my situation may be, I serve somebody that can work the situation out for me. Here is Elisha who is happened upon by this widow whose husband was a son of the prophets. He's dead, and now she and her two sons are short of income. They need some money. And, and, and they're left destitute by his perhaps sudden passing. And, and they're in debt to the collectors, the creditors. And they have nothing with which to pay. So she finds the man of God, and she pours out her complaint to Elisha. And Elisha says... What you want me to do about it? And upon the heels of that question, Elisha says, whatever I'm going to do is going to require your participation. I'm going to do what I'm going to do, but you need to do what you need to do as well. You need to participate in your own breakthrough. You need to participate in your own miracle. You need to join in with me. You don't need to just spectate, but you need to participate in your own coming out. You need to have a hand in your own miracle. You need to join in with me. Let me tell you something. Don't pray and ask God for a job and you ain't looking for one. Don't, don't, don't pray and ask God for deliverance from, from some situation and you know good and well that you are not an active participant in yourself getting out of that situation. If you dislike somebody, that dislike sooner or later will turn into hatred. You can't pray for somebody that you hate. You can't pray for somebody that you're mad at. So instead of us holding on to that stuff, get over it and let it go and let God take care of the situation. It's hard for you to hate somebody that you're praying for. It's hard for you to dislike somebody that you're praying for. But when you participate in your own deliverance, God will do what he will do. But there's still something that you have to do on your part as well. You need further proof of that? Peter was in jail. He'd been put in jail because he was preaching the gospel. And the Bible says that in the book of Acts that Peter had fallen asleep. And the Bible says that he was sleeping so soundly that God was ready to deliver him. And God sent an angel and Peter was sleeping so hard that the angel had, I believe, slap him upside the head and wake Peter up. And because, because when you know what you're doing for God is right. And when you know God is on your side, you can go to sleep at night. <laughs> Fret not yourself because of evil doers. When you know that God is on your side, you don't lose a, a, a minute's night's sleep. You sleep peacefully because you know who is in control of the situation. But the angel shook him 
and woke him up. And the angel brought Peter to the outer gates of the prison. And when Peter got to the gate that he couldn't open, the angel opened it for him. And the Bible says that when Peter got to a place where he knew where he was, the angel disappeared from his sight. Because God will do what you can't do. But when you can handle it, he'll disappear from your sight. What do you mean? Don't ask God to do what you can do for yourself. Sometimes our prayers are so full of errands and jobs that we want to run God on. Stuff that we can be doing for ourselves. Lord, I want you to go in the hospital. When the last time you went to visit somebody in the hospital? Talk that to me if you can. You help those. Lord, help the poor. What have you done to help the poor? What have you done to help those that are needed? That is stuff that you can do. God has given us the wherewithal to do that. And the Holy Ghost isn't just for shouting, but it's to enable you to get work done on Monday, to get work done on Tuesday and on Wednesday. Lord, deliver me from somebody that's all church and no obligation, all hand clapping, all foot stomping. I love that, and that's good, and we ought to celebrate in the house of God. But the Holy Spirit isn't concerned with how high you jump in praise, but rather how straight you walk in obedience to the word of God how many lives have you made better because of what you heard on Sunday morning the man of God says what do you have she says your handmaid has nothing except a pot of oil and here's what the prophet tells her to do the prophet says to her now get your son and tell your boys to go around the neighborhood Go everywhere they can. Borrow every vessel that they can find. Bring them to your house. But now listen, don't miss your blessing. Borrow not a few. That's, and that's what we're talking about. Limitations. God has so much that he can do in our lives. But we limit God and God's being able to work in our life when we don't give God everything. See, we get quiet right there because, because there are some things in your life that if you just be honest about it, you ain't ready to let go of just yet. There, there are just some things in your life that you just ain't ready to turn loose just yet. There are some sins that you ain't ready to get rid of just yet. There are some issues. There are some hangups that you are still harboring all to yourself. And the Lord said, I don't want you to bring some of it to me. I want you to bring all of it. Because if you got some secret thing that you holding on to that's hindering your spiritual growth, you can't be all of who God wants you to be with some stuff that you still trying to hide. And you can hide it behind a suit. You can hide it behind a title. You can hide it behind all of that. But when you bring it all to the Lord and give it all to the Lord, he can do more with it than you can because God is waiting for somebody that's going to bring it all to him. I want to know today, are you really sold out? I want to know, are you really sold out for God? I mean, does God have your money? Even though it ain't two or three dollars. Does God have your money? Does God have your mind? Does God have your affection? Does God have your heart? Does God have your property and your issues? Does God have your problems? Does God have your hangups? If not, then you are half sold out or almost sold out. See, that's why we can't shout out this kind of preaching. We can't, or we can't do, we can't do it with this kind of preaching because we can't get happy off of the truth because we know that there's still some stuff in our life that we have not sold out just as of yet. There's still some stuff in our life that we haven't gotten rid of just as yet. But the reason why I praise God with such enthusiasm, the reason that I praise God so much is that I give God all my worries, I give God all my cares, I give God all my issues, I ain't worried about nothing, I ain't fretting about nothing. The issue ain't for me to worry about anyway. He told me to bring my burdens to him and let him take care of me. So you got to bring him your worries. You got to bring him your cares. You got to be like, act like you on the card table playing poker. You come all in. Give it all. Put all of yourself out there. Get all yourself. Look, I ain't hiding no cards on the table. I ain't got nothing on the seat. I am putting it all out there on the table. I want to give it all to God. 
And the reason we ought to praise God is because he knows no limits. Now, Elisha says, now, if you want to come out of this, Elisha says, the way you need to come out of this, let me tell you how to do it. He says, go borrow some vessels. And however many you bring, that's how blessed you're going to be. <laughs> Told her, borrowed out a few. Imagine if she would have just used the two or three vessels that she had in her house. They'd still be hungry. But he, she told, she told, he said, go out, go out and borrow not a few. And the Bible said that they had shut the door because it said, Mama, when they got through poor, and imagine from one little bitty jar of... From one little bitty jar of oil. You may be sitting right there saying, Preacher, I ain't got but a little bit. I know God can't do nothing with it. Let me tell you, God does his best work with a little bit. God does his best work with not enough. God does his best work with insufficient. How do you know that? We're not enough. We're not efficient. But yet and still, he uses us to do his will. And to do his good pleasure. There is no good thing in me that God should use me to preach his word. But the Bible says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not Trevante Peterson. So Elisha says, now if you want to come out of this the way you're going to come out of it, he says, go and borrow vessels. Borrow not a few. In other words, if you bring a little bit, Oh, if you bring a little bit on Sunday morning, however much you bring, that's how blessed you're going to be. But if you get everything you can get your hands on, however much you want to be blessed, that's how much you got to bring. And I want to tell somebody in church this morning that if you want to be blessed, however much you brought with you this morning, that's how much you're going to leave with. That's how much you're going to get. But if you're holding something back, you will leave worship unfulfilled. Nobody can teach you faith. They can teach you church work. They can teach you how to act and respond to the welcome. They can teach you how to say, first give an honor to God who is the head of my life. To the bishop and the deacons, to the minister and friends. I just want to testify that the Lord will make a way somehow. They can, they can teach you all of that. They can teach you church talk but you got to live faith you got to go through some things in order for your faith to be developed and you got to have some history with God under your belt so that you can talk about how strong your faith is because if you ain't never been through anything if every time you get ready to go through something you throw it in the tower you can't tell me how strong your faith is. You got to have some history with God to say, man, you ain't got to tell me what God can do. I know for myself what God has the power to do. I wonder if there's anybody in here that's ever had to cry in the midnight hour. I need somebody here that's had to laugh from keep to crying. And every now and then when your company had left, you went in the room and you cried all by yourself. But you can say this morning, God will dry away your tears. God will take away those worries. God will take away those anxieties if you bring it all to the Lord. I used to foolishly believe when I was a child that faith was for old people. No offense, anybody. I used to foolishly believe that faith was for those that were older. And, you know, we used to laugh, you know, at people in church. You know, I remember, you know, how, you know, those that, we, if you were raised in church, you know, you used to play church, you know. Some of y'all still play, but that's all right. So, 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 we used, we, we used to play church. Because we would laugh, because we would laugh at how the brothers would pray. We laugh at how some of the sisters would act, you know, during, during Sunday morning worship. But some of you can say this morning that you've been through enough that you ain't playing with God no more. You, 
God has brought you through enough in your life that you ain't playing church no more. You're real about this thing. You've given God your everything. You're putting in everything that you got. You're not playing anymore because God has brought you through. And I wish I had a witness here that God has brought you through enough that you ain't got to act like nobody else. You know how to praise God for yourself because your faith is getting stronger and stronger every day that God brings you through. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. He said, go borrow some vessels and borrow not a few. Now, the allegory here, the vessels represents a body. Flesh and blood body. And the oil represents the spirit of the living God. And Elisha is saying to this woman, what I want to say to you all that are here this morning, that when you have a vessel with no oil in it, you can experience restoration without revelation. You can get knees met without revelation. And when knees are met without revelation, you're going to get in trouble. In other words, when you get done with what you need to get done in your flesh without the revelation of the spirit, you'll start bragging on yourself. And you'll start craving recognition from other people. And you'll be hurt when folk don't pat you on your back. You'll be hurt when people don't congratulate you. But when you get revelation, you do not care who likes you. You don't care who's on your side. You don't care. Just like God brought you out before he's more than able to do it again you thought it was over when you got out of that last relationship look at you now just as happy as you can be you thought it was over when you walked off that last job didn't think you found another but look at you now God has blessed you in a way that you never thought even possible let me tell you something God never closes a door Unless he getting ready to open up a window somewhere in your life. You, you, you thought when those friends got out of your life that you never, that you'd be miserable, that you never smile again. But now you're so happy you can't wait to get up in the morning because sometimes God has to separate us from those things that we feel that we can't do without to let us know that he was there all the time. Sometimes you got to hit rock bottom to appreciate the rock that's at the bottom. So he says, so he says, sometimes, sometimes God got, got, got to get, we got to get us away from a particular condition. He's got to deliver us from a particular circumstance for us to really recognize at the end of the day, God is all that I need. Oh, yeah. I'm going to ask you a few questions this morning. I know you didn't expect to have a questionnaire when you came to church, but I got one for you. It's going to be real easy. It's going to be real easy. I really believe that everybody's going to ace this questionnaire on this morning. Are y'all ready? Now, I'm going to ask you a few questions, and I'm, I'm going to give you the answer the first time. And, and I'm not going to give you the answer, you know, no more after I give it to you the first time, all right? Now, I, I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm going to give you the answer the first time. And the next time I ask the question, I want you to follow up with the answer. Y'all got it? You got to say amen. Now, I, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to give you the answer. And the next Next question I'm going to ask, I need you to follow up with an answer. Now, when Jesus was born of a virgin, the person behind that was God. That's the answer, all right? Who put Jesus in the womb of Mary? That's the question. The answer is, now who turned water into wine through Jesus? Who raised Peter's mother-in-law through Jesus? Who got Lazarus up out of the grave through Jesus? Who raised Jesus out of the dead? You got it. Now, when you was in trouble, who got you out? When you were down to your last dime, who came to your rescue? When your friends were few and you needed somebody to talk to, who was by your side? Jesus is all that we need. God is the answer to every problem that we could ever run across in this life. But without the Spirit, we can experience restoration without revelation. He told her, he said, go get some vessels. Fill it with all. Because if there's no oil in the vessel, not only will you have restoration without revelation, but there'll be reformation without revival. Reformation without revival, get this, nature forms us. Sin deforms us. Environments conform us. Schools inform us. Prisons reform us. 
but only Christ can transform us. The Bible said that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He is a new creation, and if you experience reformation without revival, you'll really be empty in showing how much you love God. When you don't have revival without reformation, all the sermons you hear preached won't do you a bit of good. You'll forget it by the time you get to the car. You'll be to cuss somebody out in the parking lot. You'll forgot that you just be in worship service when you have that kind of spirit. Some folk think the Spirit is just here to keep you happy, but the Spirit is really here to keep you holy. Amen. The Holy Spirit, I say it again, is not just good for Sunday morning worship. It's good for dealing with your boss on Monday morning. It's good for dealing with your children. At the, and late at night, have I got one with you? It's good for all seasons and all times of your life. I get happy about how God could use people like us Amen. to do his will. To do his pleasure. None of us are worthy. And it shows us just how God can take people that we seem to feel are nobody. Those that are on the outskirts. Those that are not worthy, we feel. And God can do his best work with those kind of people. Preacher, I ain't got nothing. Except a little pot of oil. That's all you need. That's all you I, I ain't got nothing but a little bit of oil, and, I, and, and I'm going to use this. I'm, I'm going to feed my children, and then we, we just going to wait on see what God going to do. Whatever you have is enough for God to be able to use if you're willing to let God have it. Now, I want, you, I want you to look at this. I want you to look at this. See how God sustained this woman, not only her, but her son. For the rest of their days. Yeah. Off of one little bitty pot of oil. Can you imagine as they're in the room. You got all these vessels spread around. And she know how much she got in this jar. Because you know, I, know, I know how much I got in here. I said I was going to use it. Make something for me and my kids. And then I was going to be over with. But imagine her surprise. As every vessel she comes to. Is filled to the brim. She moves to another vessel. She pours out. It's filled to the brim. She gets to a point to where the room is full of vessels. There's no more room to pour in. I still got a pot full. What am I going to do? I need some more vessels. Mama, it ain't no more vessels. Now you and your children take what you got and sell it. And what you got, you'll live off there. Now see. God sustained this woman and her kids for the rest of their days with not enough. God sustained her and her kids for the rest of their days off of a little bitty corner of all. So what is it in your life this morning that you feel like is not enough? Preacher, you know, I'm, 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 this is all I got. You know, I, I don't have what anybody else has. That's our, that's our problem. Too many times we want to approach God based off of what other people have done. Too, too many times you, you, you want to approach God based off of the testimony of somebody else. But if you remember David, um, when David was going into battle, and the Bible says that David called for the ephod. And you know, during that time, it was only the priests that would wear the ephod. And, 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 and David said, you know what? I, I got to hear from God. I got to talk to God. So he called and he told me, he said, bring me the ephod. What are you saying, David? I don't need no preacher going to God for me. I don't need no priest going to God for me. I don't need nobody approaching God on my behalf. I can go to God for myself. I can talk to God for myself. Don't nobody know what God has done in my life like I know it. Don't nobody know how God has brought me out like I know it. So I don't need you approaching God on my behalf. Lord, here am I. I come to you right now, Lord. I'm laying out my cares before you because I know what you have the power to do in my life yes, sir. Yes. Bring, bring me the ephod David, David this is out of the norm 
Nobody's ever done this. I know. Ain't nobody ever had a relationship with God like I got. Ain't nobody ever needed God like I need him right now. So you know what? The, the priest can go to God for me, but he don't know. He don't know what I need to talk to God about. He don't know. He don't know. He don't know. And it's good. We come here and you stand and you ask the church to pray for you, but you never really put down your real prayer request. You never, you never really put down what you really need prayer for because you're too worried about what folk going to think about you. You're too worried about what folk going to think. Let them think what they going to think. Let them say what they are going to say. At the end of the day, they need God just like you need God. They need deliverance just like you need deliverance. Don't worry about what nobody else is going to say. Your real question should be, is God, is God satisfied with me? Is God satisfied with my life? Is he satisfied with the way that I'm living? I don't care where you've been, what you've done. What you've been involved in. I don't care how dirty the sins of this life have gotten you. You are never too far out that my God can't reach you. Never too far out. You are never too dirty that God cannot clean you up. Never too messed up that God cannot straighten you out. But you got to let God be God. Take God out of the box. Take the limitations off of God. Take the regulations off of God. The Bible says that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you could ever ask for faith. He got power. Almighty power. He can do anything but fear. This man, this man, this man got so much power that he took one little bit of powder bowl. And allow that woman to pay her debt. It, it, it's almost like she had she had JEA coming, putting notes on her door, say, "Hey, we're coming to turn your lights off. We're coming. We're co we coming to turn them off. We're coming to turn them off. Hey, tomorrow we're coming to turn them off." She knew she knew it was imminent yeah. that they were coming. They were gonna take her sons. Yeah. They were gonna take them away because of the debt that she had. But you see, she didn't run to none of her friends. No. She didn't go out in the square and said, hey, I need somebody to help me. She, she didn't go in and, and, and under, she didn't go do none of that. The Bible says that she went to the man of God. She went to the man of God. And he was able to help her with her situation. She knew where to go to when she was going through trouble. She knew where to go to to get this worry, these cares in her life alleviated, she went to the man of God. Amen. There was nothing so special about the man of God that she went to him. But you have to understand that during this time, God always had a set person that was in leadership, just like Moses. There was always a set person that had conversation with God. So that is why they did it. Same way with David, as I mentioned, it was always the priest that went to God on behalf of the people. But David said, you know, I don't need you going to talk to God for me. I know God for myself. Amen. That's why I need, to even, I need to go to God for myself because I need to get these worries, these cares off my heart. We serve a God, y'all, that knows no limits. As I preached about on last Sunday evening, we talked about in Luke chapter 5, where we talked about how those men had been out there fishing all night. Didn't catch anything. Jesus comes on the boat. They catch so much that they had to call for other people to come and get some of the fish. And he shows himself there to be a net breaking, boat sinking, blessing kind of God. And he blesses you in such a way that you can't keep it to yourself. Hey, man, you get some of these fish. You, you, you get some of these. Hey, you get that. He blesses you in such a way that you can be a blessing to somebody else. We serve a God that knows no limits. We serve a God that knows no limitations. And I'm so glad that he does not have limitations. Because if you be real with yourself, he had to reach out a long way to get you. He had to reach out a long way to come where you were. And I'm so glad that he said, oh, well, you know what? They're too far out. I can't do nothing with them. I can't help them. But anybody, anybody that would make up in their mind to make Jesus their choice, he says, you know what? I'm ready. 
I'm available. I'm here for you. As a matter of fact, I've been here all the time. You remember those nights that you was leaving the club and you were so drunk you didn't know a red light from a green light? It was me that guided you to the house. You remember when you were some places that you shouldn't have been with somebody that you shouldn't have been with? And instead of you getting caught up, I let you sneak out the back door without hurt harm. I let you sneak out with, without hurt harm or that. I was the one that protected you. I was the one. You know where you were when God found you. You know how deep you were when he had to reach down and pick you up. But I'm so glad that he'll pick you up. Turn you around. Then he'll place your feet on solid ground. He'll establish your going and your coming. You'll be blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed going out, blessed coming in. When you're walking in the pathway of God, when you're walking in the pathway of God, we serve a God that knows no limits. He does not have limits as to what he can do in our life. So I want your faith today to get to the level where you believe God can do anything. I know he's able to do anything. Look at the White House now. So, so he's able, so God is able. He's able to do exceeding, abundant. That simply means more. Whatever you think he wants to do more. Whatever you're desiring, he wants to do more. Our expectations here, man, I would like to see every seat filled up in here, but God's expectation may be what, man? This building ain't going to be able to hold what I'm going to do in your life. This building is not going to be able to contain what I'm going to do with you all. But we got to take the limits off of God and believe him to be the one that can take us all the way the song said, all the way from earth to, let Jesus lead you. And let me tell you, if you let Jesus lead you, you'll never go wrong. Amen. You'll never go wrong. You're on the right path, and you're in the right way when you're following God. Believe me when I say God can blow your mind if you let him. He can blow your mind if you let him. If you really trust God. And here's the key. Put your faith in him. Just like we put our faith in the things of this world and the people of this world, how many times has it failed you? I know, I know, I know it's failed you a lot. But when you put your faith in God, let me tell you, it's almost like, y'all remember the story of the three little pigs? And it was like, you know, the, the one little pig had built his house out of sticks. And it said that one day the big bad wolf, he came and he huffed and he puffed. And that little house came trim it on down. What was the other one? It sticks and what was the? Straw. We got it. All right. And one built his out of straw. And I said, one day the big bad wolf, he came and he huffed and he puffed. And eventually that house fell down. But one had some sense. You know what, man? I'm going to give you some of these bricks out here in the backyard. You know what? And it said he built his house and the wolf huffed and he puffed and he huffed and he put, God so bad he had to take a break and get his inhaler. He said, I'll be back in just a minute. And he huffed and he puffed till he was out of air. He said, you know what? I'm going to leave it alone. When your faith is in Jesus Christ, you got it in a solid foundation. And when your faith is in Christ, I don't care what is going on in the world. Let the wind blow. Let the lightning flash. Thunder roll as loud as you want to roll. My God can do exceeding and abundant. Above all that I could even ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Believe that today. Receive that today. Apply it in your life. Whatever area you need God. Let God have that situation. You can, I, I, you've been fooling with it 20, 30 years. What you done did with it? Act nothing. Let God have it. <laughs> let God have it. And let him take care of it. Let God blow your mind. My brother, my sister, if you're here today and you don't know the Lord, you find yourself standing outside of the ark of safety. You have not yet had your sins washed away. 
by the blood of the Lamb. You are not a member of the body of Christ, which is the church of Christ. This is the greatest invitation that will ever be offered to you in this life, and that is an invitation to come to Jesus Christ. He's been thinking about you for quite a while. He was thinking about you before you even formed in your mother's womb, before you came into this world. He had you on his mind, and he was thinking about you. God looked throughout the timeline of man, knew that man was going to be in need of a Savior, knew that man was going to be in need of salvation. He looked, couldn't find one that was worthy. So he said, you know what? I guess I got to go and do it myself. The Bible says that he came down a nine-month-long train named the Virgin Mary. He was born of a woman in this world. The Bible says that he lived. He did no wrong. Neither was there any guile found in his mouth. He was not guilty of sedition. He was not guilty of heresy. But yet, when they were given the choice to choose between him and Barabbas. They said, kill Jesus and give us Barabbas. Can you see him now as he's being betrayed? The same one that dipped his hand in the dish with him has now gone away to betray our Lord for 30 little measly pieces of silver. He's gone away and betrayed our Lord with the kiss and the Lord is being taken away. I do believe that I would have been Peter. You ain't finna take my Lord. The Bible said Peter took out his sword, cut off Matthias' ear. Jesus picked it up off the ground, put it back on the man's ear and said, Peter, he that lives by the sword shall also die by the sword. Jesus is now being taken from judgment hall to judgment hall. He said, Pilate said, I cannot find no fault in this man. Pilate told him one time, said, man, who are you really? Who do you think you are? Jesus just sat there and looked at him like he's crazy. He really was crazy because he didn't know who he was talking to. Jesus just sitting there looking at him. Pilate said, don't you know that I have the power to take your life? Jesus said, no man taking my life. I lay it down. And if I lay it down, I also have the power to pick it back up again. He's giving them away. He's giving Jesus away into the hand of them. They whipped him all night long. They beat him until he's a bloody pup. Now they've given him a cross to carry up to Golgotha's hill, the, 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 the hill that was shaped like a skull. And he's had to go up there bearing the cross. Bearing a cross. Got to the top of the hill. They put nails in his hands. And I'm not talking about nails like you see. I'm talking about railroad spikes. They put nails in his hand. They stretched him out wide. Put nails in his feet. And they hung him up on the cross. Can you see the pain and the agony that he's enduring just for you? I'm imagining that he's struggling to breathe. Now every time he want to get a good breath, he got to pull himself up on the cross. In order to even get a good breath. Can you see the pain that he endured? Just so our ungrateful selves might have a right to eternal life. Can you see it? Can you see him bearing a cross? Can you see him suffering? I mean, all the man wanted was a drink of water. They gave him a sponge full of vinegar. Jesus got to the point where we knew his time was coming. He said, Eli, Eli. La my sabbatana, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he gave up his spirit. They wanted to make sure he was dead, so you know what they did? They said that he took a spear, stuck him through his side, and they said it came all the way up and it pierced his sacred heart. Blood and water came out of his side, which is a sign that he was already dead. Because, you know, after you die, blood and the water separates in the body. And this fulfills the prophecy of the Old Testament where it says that not a bone in his body would be broken. He did it. And in his dying, with that blood that was shed, he purchased the church with his own blood. And you and I today have an opportunity to become a member of that body. To become a member of his church. And he said, if you remain faithful unto death, he said, I'll give you a crown that will never fade away. So if you're here today and you desire salvation, you come by hearing the word. What is the word? The gospel. What is the gospel? He lived. He died, and on the third day, he rose again with all power in his hand. Hey. You've heard it. You've heard it. Now believe it. He said, except that you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sin. After belief, repent of your sins. What is repentance? A change within my mind that produces a change in my action. 
After repentance with my mouth, I confess that Jesus is the Son of the living God. And after confession, I am willing to be baptized for the remission of my sin. Have my sins washed away, eradicated, done away with. Never to come up before you in this life and neither the life that is to come. And the Lord himself will add you to his body. Maybe you're here today and you're already a Christian. You said, preacher, I'm standing in the need of prayer. The Bible still says that the prayers of the righteous, they avail as much. So my brother, my sister, don't put off today for what you plan on doing tomorrow. The only moment that you have is right now. What are you going to do with your right now? As together we stand and sing the song of invitation.